For kind of Scott's kind of talked about the prevalence there of, of VIPH. So we've got a high incidence of, or, or there's a high prevalence of VIPH in racehorses, but only a small number display this epistaxis and nasal bleeding, which probably indicates the more severe end of the scale. In terms of the things that we have good evidence for, that I'll kind of go through in some, um, some, de or, or concentrating on the treatments actually, there's no medication or management strategy that's 100% effective. That's kind of one key thing to, to bear in mind. There's nothing that's been shown to completely get rid of VIPH. There's good evidence that furosemide, also known as furosemide, reduces the severity of EIPH, so I'll spend some time talking about that. And I'm not going to talk about it, but there is a, some fairly good evidence as well that furosemide has a performance enhancing effect. I haven't really got time to go into that today and, and why or why that might not be the case, but certainly there's fairly good evidence that it has a performance enhancing effect. Why might furosemide have an effect on, on EIPH? I, I guess I should say at the start as well, I'm, we're thinking about horses with EIPH that don't have any other problems. So we're Scott mentioned the, the negative pressures within the airways. So we're talking about horses that maybe ha don't have anything that's going to make negative intrapleural pressures worse. And we're not talking about horses that maybe have something like atrial fibrillation, for example, which make back pressure onto the, the lungs worse. We're talking about kind of clinically normal, if you like, in inverted commas, horses and what we could potentially use to, to try and mitigate against the likelihood of bleeding. So furosemide might work in theory, and, and here's the reason why it might work. Um, furosemide has effect, so furosemide's a diuretic, also known as Lasix, it was maybe the old, um, the old name for it, or one of the, the trade names for it. So furosemide actually has an effect on uh, diuresis, it, it tells the kidneys, it makes the kidneys produce more urine. Um, and there's good evidence that it'll do that in horses fairly effectively. So we've got a nice um, uh, graph from a study here showing urine volume up here, hours post-injection of furosemide, and you can see this really nice spike. Furosemide's given at time there, and then we can see this ma massive spike there in urine volume associated with the administration of that furosemide, and we have the controls along the bottom there. So good evidence that it certainly increases urine volume. And similarly, because it increases urine volume, what it's actually doing is taking fluid away from the blood, uh, the blood that's circulating around the body. So there's good evidence that by doing that, it lowers blood pressures as well. So here we have another study which is looking at um, right atrial pressure. So put, there's, there's lots of types of pressures we could look at, but in this case, it's right atrial pressure. Here we have the, the values at rest, and then we have uh, the, the values at exercise, and it will just, we'll just maybe concentrate on these at exercise. And the, the bars along the, the along here that you can see, we've got control here. So these are horses that aren't given any furosemide. Um, these are horses one hour post furosemide, two hours post furosemide, three hours and then four hours post furosemide. So you can say if it, see very nicely there in the horses that exercise and less so at the horses that, uh, that, that are at rest, that furosemide, the administration of furosemide by about two hours, you get a maximal decrease in the blood pressure and that right atrial blood pressure in these horses while they're exercising. So good evidence that furosemide has an effect on urine volume and the relevant blood pressures that might be important in trying to prevent um, EIPH. There's another graph of the same thing. Um, it's important to, to kind of take it in context here. We're not going to, as I said, there's no treatment that's 100% effective at, at reducing EIPH, so we're not going to completely um, take away EIPH. And there are plenty of studies that have shown that using furosemide, you don't get a reduction. So a lot of the early studies looking at drugs like furosemide were particularly looking at do these horses bleed or don't those horses bleed? And almost invariably they found that drugs like furosemide had no effect on trying to stop completely EIPH. So here was one example, a couple of, or a couple of studies actually there from the USA, so Sweeney et al, 1990, looking at the effects of furosemide in the racing time of thoroughbreds, found that furosemide didn't prevent the development of EIPH. Um, and about 32, so 61% of the, th of the EIPH positive horses which were given furosemide remained EIPH positive after that race. Another study by Burks et al in 2002, there's no difference in the incidence or severity of EIPH when observed between horses with or without pre-race furosemide in, uh, administration. And there are a number of reasons why this might um, or might not have shown effect, these types of studies that were, were used in this case. But again, what we say we try to do is try and look at the evidence that we have, the, the kind of the best evidence we can, uh, um, uh, and we tend to use these kind of this filtered evidence, if you like. Or it's easiest for us as vets to use this filtered evidence to try and 
um, make it easier for ourselves to kind of accumulate that mass amount of data that there is out there. So there's a really nice system of what we call systematic review, which looks at all the different studies and kind of looks at how good those studies are and says, okay, these are really good studies. We will kind of trust these studies and we won't trust those studies because they're maybe not as good. Maybe they don't have controls. Maybe they were done in a very artificial scenario. Um, maybe there's lots of other flaws in, in the study design. And this um, nice systematic review by Sullivan et al. Um, showed that there was high quality evidence, albeit limited, so s a small number of studies that showed furosemide reduces the incidence and the severity of EIPH in thoroughbred and standard bred racehorses. So here's one of the studies they quoted as being the really good study, which was at Hainscliffe et al. in 2009, and um, just put the graph there um, taken directly from the paper. And here we have the on the left hand side, we've got the percentage of horses here, we've got EIPH severity along here. But if we just look at this bar chart here, we've got EIPH um, greater than zero here. So here we've got the horses that have had been given furosemide, here we've got the horses that aren't giving, uh, haven't been given any furosemide. So um, just if we think about any grade of EIPH greater than zero, we can see that furosemide reduces the severity, or reduces the percentage of horses that are showing signs of bleeding. If you want to kind of categorise that down a little bit more in terms of EIPH severity, again, we've got furos uh, furosemide treated horses in the black, the non treated horses in the white. You can see that all the furosemide treated horses, the severity of the EIPH is much less in those furosemide treated horses. And this is a really nice, well conducted study, a really nice evidence showing that furosemide definitely or definitively. Um, reduce the severity of EIPH um, in this group of horses. So there are, there's a couple of other studies that, that kind of show similar findings, but um, suffice to say, as I say, it's a, it's a very useful treatment for potentially reducing the severity. In practical terms, furosemide is used fairly frequently in UK racing. It's used as a training aid for severe or susceptible bleeders. Um, the kind of the standard dose would be five mils of dimazon, which is the kind of product that's that's available for veterinary treatment nowadays. And usually it's used based on the study that you saw there um, showing the effects on blood pressure and urine volume about two to four hours before a horse will do fast work. Um, and the detection time for that would be about 48 hours, so withdrawal time of about four or five days for the use of furosemide. So because it's been shown to have fairly good um, results, it's, it's used relatively frequently for, for that in, in racing. Oh God, a bit of rush, eh? 7%. Um, so, so um, that's something we have good evidence for. What about treatments that we have some evidence for in terms of efficacy, I, one way or the other, that they either do work or they don't work? So there's fairly weak evidence that there are other medications or management strategies affect or don't affect the severity of EIPH. So what I mean by that is we can't really d definitively rule them out as being very useful and can't definitively rule them out. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. So lots of these studies are maybe based on treadmill scenarios or treadmill um, studies, which could be a relatively artificial situation, an artificial population. These are obviously of often um, horses maybe at the more severe end of the scale, so can we, um, can we translate that to a population of, of horses racing um, and a, a greater number of horses racing? So the, the types of drugs that have been looked at in this context or that I'm going to put in this category would be bronchodilators again. Aminocaproic acid, which is one of a number of drugs to improve clotting that have been looked at in terms of EIPH on the basis that trying to improve clotting might stop the, the bleeding into the airways. Glucocorticoids, again steroids, anti-inflammatory drugs in terms of do they prevent um, EIPH um, occurring in the, or do they reduce the severity. non anti-inflammatory drugs. Pentoxifiline, which is a drug which um, changes the ability of red blood cells to squeeze through the capillaries, so could we kind of um, improve that and maybe reduce the likelihood of EIPH. Glyceratine nitro and nitro nitroglycerin, which is a, a dilates blood vessels and then nasal strips. So I'll kind of break these up a little bit into um, different types of categories. So the first thing that you might want to do is try and reduce those negative airway pressures. So, so Scott was talking there earlier about the fact that this negative intrapleural pressure created the gradient, the pressure gradient, which allowed um, the, the bleeding to occur. So we can we do things to try and reduce that, those negative airway pressures if we have some low-grade disease. So, so bronchodilators, as we said, may have some effect on, on inflammatory airway disease, low-grade inflammatory airway disease. Can that actually improve or, or lessen the likelihood of, of EIPH developing? There are a variety of studies, or there's a, a couple of studies showing that there's no there's no, and, and again, these are kind of treadmill-based studies, but there's no effect on blood pressure within the lungs with these types of things and standing or exercising horses. So ventipulin didn't appear to affect standing uh, or exercising horses in terms of the blood pressures within their lungs. And there was no incident uh, effect on the incidence of EIPH as well. 
in that study using uh, uh, looking at ventipulmin. Nasal strips are an interesting one. So the theory with nasal strips, I don't know if any of you have ever used the nasal strips. Remember, nasal strips were around for a long time. Lots of athletes were wearing nasal strips for a long time, weren't they? And, and there, were, there was a trend for, for, for use in human, in human uh, uh, sporting endeavours. So the theory behind the nasal strips was that it expanded the external nostrils that potentially reduced the, the negative intrapleural pressures um, uh, and potentially reduced the likelihood of EIPH. Um, I'll put their race day ban UK because it's important to know obviously that they are actually banned um, in the UK whether we want to use them or not. Are they actually effective in EIPH? Well, there were some studies, there were some studies kind of suggesting that that maybe was the case. Um, so, so if we kind of look at a couple of those uh, or, or certainly one of these studies just now, um, there were quite small numbers in this study and they were treadmill studies and so it was kind of deemed low quality evidence but there was some evidence that there was some improvement in uh, the like uh, the degree of EIPH. So here we've got, we're just concentrating the top half of this graph here just now, we've got EIPH graded as um, uh, the amount of red blood cells in the bronchial alveolar lavage fluid and here we've got a control sample here, we've got the nasal strip sample here, we've got furosemide cases here, so cases given furosemide and they've got both nasal, um, uh, the nasal strips and the furosemide. You could see even without the furosemide, the nasal strips were having some beneficial effect, but obviously it was a much better effect with the, the, the furosemide and, and the nasal strips and furosemide together. Similarly, we had a similar scenario here. Again, we've got looking at a slightly different thing here. We've got looking at pulmonary artery pressure. So we're, that's the something that we're trying to change with these nasal strips in theory, or, or they were trying to change. And again, we've got the controls. We've got the nasal strips here. No change in the pulmonary artery pressures here. A, a reduction with the furosemide and a reduction with the nasal strips and the furosemide. So kind of conflicting evidence there as to whether it was um, uh, having an effect, if it was having an effect on the right thing that we thought it was having an effect on, as it were. So kind of the jury's out on whether these are useful or not, but whether they are useful or not, they're, they're not um, allowed in UK racing. Um, what about preventing bleeding, encouraging clotting? So there's a lot of, there's been a lot, of, there's, there's so many drugs that have been used for EIPH and one of the kind of big categories of drugs, if you like, that were, that were used for a long time and, and have kind of um, gone by the wayside to, to a great extent now would be drugs that were tried to prevent the likelihood of a horse bleeding. And so there are a number of drugs we use to um, potentially prevent bleeding for, for you know, reasons of you know, trauma, for example, when, when there's maybe an increased protein for hemorrhage in certain areas. So there are drugs like aminocuproic acid is one of those. Oestrogens as well have been um, promoted potentially as one of those. So, so there are, have, have been few studies on these types of things, but there was one study looking at these two compounds in particular. So conjugated, uh, the effects of conjugated oestrogens and aminocuproic acid on the exercise induced pulmonary uh, hemorrhage in racehorses. Again, this was a treadmill study looking, taking a group of bleeders and looking at those before and after using these treatments and it was found to have no effect on EIPH at all. And it was actually found that the aminocuproic acid might actually have a detrimental effect on performance. So no evidence um, there or, or, or some evidence that these potentially don't have an effect. What about reducing airway inflammation? So um, the, as, it, as, as we kind of said earlier, we can kind of talk about the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and we can talk about the, the steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like glucocorticoids. Um, and there's been very few studies on the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, perhaps just because people have gone for the more potent um, side of things, the more potent drugs like the, like the glucocorticoids. So this has been looked into indeed, um, and there are a couple of studies, uh, and I've put one up there. So this is a study by Manahar et al, looking at dexamethasone, one of those anti-inflammatory drugs, and looking at whether it affected um, exercise-induced arterial hypoxia, so hypoxemia in the thoroughbreds. Um, and also looking at the degree um, whether it, uh, it prevented those horses bleeding. So this drug was used for three days prior to, tre that prior to a treadmill experiment. So they looked at them, they gave them dexamethasone for three days, they put them on the treadmill, they looked at the degree of hypoxemia that developed on the treadmill and had no effect on that degree of hypoxemia and also no effect on the occurrence of EIPH. But they didn't measure the degree of that EIPH. So we can't say for sure whether it didn't reduce the likelihood, uh, the, the degree of that uh, of EIPH. Finally, um, the other thing we can kind of think about doing is trying to change blood pressures in the capillaries and improve them. So that was one of the theories about, I would say probably about 20 years ago, people got very excited about these vasodilators. So these are the types of things. So nitric oxide, um, you're possibly aware of these types of rescue remedies you have for angina. So you can get creams, you can get little sprays that you put under your tongue, etc. And what those drugs do is they very potently and ve a very short term have a very short effect on blood 
vessel function and they dilate those blood vessels. So the theory was that because these pulmonary pressures are really, really high, if we dilate the blood vessels, by dilating the blood vessels, we're going to reduce the blood pressure. Therefore, we're like less likely to have um, EIPH. So, so these were looked at um, with, with some studies um, probably in the sort of early 2000s, I would say it probably is, and, and people looked at and other drugs as well. So nitric oxide was one of them. Viagra is another one, uh, sildenafil, which uh, dilates blood vessels. It's used in pul human pulmonary hypertension. People thought, well, that might be a great drug to use as well. And then I put in this category as well, it does a slightly different thing, this drug pentoxifiline. So it, um, it sli does a slightly different thing. As I say, what it does is it tries to default, it sort of changes the, the, um, the, the red blood cells slightly and makes them more easy to, to kind of squeeze through the capillaries. So, so therefore making transport through those capillaries slightly easier. So the variety of studies there, I've just kind of put up a few of the kind of the, the captions from those, um, those studies there, but basically there was, there was no effect of, of any of these compounds actually at all. And in fact, there was some evidence that, that some of those things might actually um, make things worse. So nitroglycerine uh, and nitric oxide, actually, there was some evidence that it actually might make um, EIPH slightly worse, actually. So no evidence of, or, uh, or, uh, no evidence of an effect on EIPH at all. Finally, what do we have? what we don't have evidence for but we benefit from so a variety of things that we really just don't know very much about at all actually and we, we really need to, to have some um, evidence for. Further on, I, I mentioned briefly that, that, that we kind of there's some fair evidence that furosemide has a performance an, uh, enhancing effect but we don't know exactly why it has that performance of enhancing effect. Is it something to do with um, weight loss? Is it maybe something to do with airflow? Because furosemide can affect airway function as well. We just don't know the answer to that. Um, we don't know the treatment options following EIPH that may reduce the likelihood of it occurring. So Scott said about this kind of the fact that with time these horses may get worse and worse and worse and worse. So a question we might ask ourselves is, well if that's getting worse and worse and worse and if that's a type of scarring, why don't we use anti-inflammatory drugs to try and minimise the likelihood of that occurring? And we just don't know the answer to that. So, so that's rather than using drugs like glucocorticoids to prevent EIPH, could glucocorticoids actually stop the likelihood of horses bleeding again and again and again or could it uh, reduce the the, the, the likelihood of that and maybe increase the, the longevity of these horses' career, so we just don't know the answer to that. There's no evidence for many of these herbal remedies, infeed supplements, there's loads and loads and loads of them about that, that are purported to improve um, EIPH or reduce the likelihood of EIPH and we just don't know and there's a, a lot of cost to these, so we'd like to know whether these are useful or not. Um, and we also don't know some very basic things like, for example, whether preventing exposure to airborne particles. We talked about the dust earlier today, such as so things like mouldy feed, etc., might reduce the risk of the IPH. Common sense suggests that it might do because it might improve the, the health of the airways and therefore um, uh, have a, a positive impact and reduce the, the, the negative intrapleural pressures. But we just don't know the answer to that because that work hasn't been done as well. So um, something else we need to do. So I think I'll end it there. A very quick run through of EIPH treatment.